And uh, it's only four chapters, so it's a little challenging to find, but it's before, right after Obadiah and uh, right before Micah. So, and it's on page 1366 if you have my Bible, which you don't, but that's where it is on my Bible. So let's turn there, and we're studying chapter 2 today, and uh, we're going to read the entire chapter and then consider its application to our life this morning. Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. All your waves and your breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Father, we thank you for the enormous privilege it is to, to open your word, for us to be able to gather in your name. I thank you for these men and women that even on a rainy, blustery day uh, still want to be here in fellowship. They still want to enjoy worshiping you. They still want to hear your word and, and let it change and transform and conform their lives to the image of Christ. They still want to be in relationship with each other. They still have a heart to care. I'm really inspired by that. I thank you for every person that's here today. And I pray, God, with this divine appointment of this particular text and this particular moment in human history, God, that you would use it to advance the cause of Christ. So Holy Spirit, we're all here and we're eager for you to speak. We're eager for you to minister to us. And we know you'll do that individually in a very particular and beautiful way. And so we want to say thank you in advance for your work. And may our heart response be pleasing to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So last week we covered uh, the first chapter of Jonah. And, uh, of course, we discovered that God had appointed this man named Jonah to go to a wicked city called Nineveh. Now, instead of obeying the Lord, he immediately disobeyed the Lord. And uh, because of his animosity toward the uh, people of Nineveh, uh, the Assyrians, he decided to go the opposite direction. And he went 2,500 miles to the farthest known port at that time, which is in uh, southwestern Spain. And so he made his way. And as we talked last week, he had to make a whole series of decisions in his disobedience to God, which is how we have to disobey God, too. Most of the time, we have a whole series of things that we have to decide to accomplish whatever we're going to do that's an act of defiance to God's will. And so we find that, you know, Jonah had to make a decision to, to not, you know, want to be on board with God's plan to save the, the uh, Ninevites, the Assyrians. Why? Because they were uh, a race of people that were very violent and were known for being brutal in war. And they were the arch enemies of Israel. And so knowing God's heart, we're going to find out in chapter 3 that, that Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to come to Christ. He didn't want them to come to God, to have a, re a relationship with God, because this hatred ran so deep in his own heart. And so he just said, I'm not doing it. And then he had to, he had to make a decision, I'm going to go as far away as I can. And then he had to make a decision to buy boat passage and put the money in the captain's hand. And then he had to walk the plank to get up on the boat. And then he had to watch the plank removed and he had to watch it sail away. All these decisions, the packing, the, 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 the thinking, and you know the Holy Spirit of God was working on him, but he just, have you ever done that? The Holy Spirit's working, trying to tell you something. It's like, yeah, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, you know? Well, that's where, Noah, uh, where Jonah was. And so he travels 2,500 miles away and unfortunately, he discovered what most of us discover when we're trying to run from God is that you can run from him, but you can't hide because God is everywhere. And so God allowed a storm and uh, created this storm that eventually led to Jonah being thrown overboard uh, and to what he thought would be his death. And I can only imagine the, 
the thoughts that must have been swirling through his mind as he was swirling in the waters. I think that, you know, we don't know a lot about Jonah, but I'm thinking he probably had family, probably thought about his wife, probably thought about his kids, probably thought about his community, probably thought about this act of defiance and disobedience, probably wondered how God was going to receive him, if God would receive him at all, as a result of this complete violation of the call of God in his life, probably felt like an utter failure and that there was really no hope for him. As we talked about last week, I believe he was probably so depressed, which is why I think he was sleeping so soundly in the hull of the ship during such a raging storm, but he was so depressed that he just didn't even care anymore and he just wanted to die. And so for him, it was a way out. It was an escape. And of course, you know, um, it's obvious that anybody that, that, uh, that takes their life for whatever reason, is trying to find a way out. It's the, the circumstances are too overwhelming. It seems too hopeless. And I don't know if you've ever been there where you've actually thought about taking your life, maybe not even planning it out, but actually just kind of thinking, I just want out of here. Then you're an exception because most people have at least considered that, you know, a passing thought. I want out. Well, he, he went much farther than simply a passing thought. And he actually brought this, these events to pass where his life was at stake. And so in his last conscience moments, um, he's got to be thinking just these hopeless, despairing thoughts. And then suddenly everything grew dark. And that's where we pick it up in chapter 2. We find that God provided a great fish. I mentioned it last week. It's called the dogfish. It's the largest shark known to mankind. They grow to to sizes of 13 tons, which is 26,000 pounds, 40 feet long. And they can swallow not one, not two, but three men in a gulp. I mean, that's easy for them. The, the, the size of their mouth is large enough. And, uh, you know, we think about that. And we, you know, some people are like, oh, that's got to be a fable. That's got to be legend. That's got to be just an allegory, something to kind of express a spiritual truth. Except for the fact that God uses animals and, and plant life and everything all through the Bible. And uh, we, I kind of facetiously talked about God having kind of Aquaman powers. But we find that he's not just limited to the sea, but God can do anything he wants with anything that he's created, including all the animals. We find that uh, the Noah, uh, during Noah's day, that the animals actually came to him. God commanded them to come. When I was a young person, I thought, boy, Noah must have been busy. No wonder it took 100 years to build this ark because it took that long to round up all these animals, you know? But no, the Bible says that God spoke to these animals and they came of their own accord and walked up the the gangplank into this boat that God had provided through Noah. Animals and insects in Egypt. I mean, we got frogs, we got locusts, we got flies, we got gnats, and they all respond to the command of God to accomplish his will. Quail in the wilderness in the book of Exodus chapter 16. Balaam's donkey, prophetically speaking to the prophet, these are, this is another animal that was actually given the capacity of speech. So the animal's thinking these things, but God gives them speech to be able to communicate these things to a hard-hearted prophet. We have hornets driving out the Canaanites in Joshua. Joshua's thinking, how in the world are we going to take the Canaanites? This is an impossible task. God says, no worry, I've got hornets. You know, if you, can you imagine hornets coming at you? Like a whole mob of them. It's just the sky blackens with hornets. This is what God is able to do. And then we've got venomous snakes biting the Israelites to bring about a repentance in their hearts. God calls these snakes lions in the, in the lion den with Daniel. And God closes the mouths of these lions, prevents them from eating, and then commands them to eat those that actually threw Daniel in in the first place. And then, of course, we've got the fish that, um, that Peter was called by Jesus Christ to go fish for caught this fish, opened its mouth in, in response to the command of Christ, and there found a coin to pay the temple tax for Jesus and himself. Um, somebody told me last week after the sermon that maybe that's where uh, Jonah's wallet went, is that uh, it's actually some of Jonah's change that fell on the bottom and this fish picked it up. But however it happened, it's like God has this capacity to do these things. It's, it's really amazing. So here, here's an observation. 
I'm thinking, what needed to happen in order for this great fish to be in this particular place at this particular time? First of all, God had to create a fish that was big enough to swallow Jonah. And so God uh, certainly didn't have any problem accomplishing that. But this fish also had to have the capacity in its digestive tract for this man to live in that environment for three days. This particular fish was a part of God's plan, I believe, from the very beginning. There's a great verse in Ephesians 2.10 that says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And, and we all, I, I don't think of animals very often when I think of that verse, do you? I think of people. I think God has created in advance this, this master of the universe and the master of our lives creates these events for us to walk in before time began and that our lives matter, and, and the events of your life count, and the relationships and the interactions and the, the network of relationships that are unique to you are being used by God for the advancement of the kingdom. But we would have to say at the same time that God has the same plan for animal life. Certainly that's the case with this great fish. The fish had to be born at a specific time, in a specific part of the region, in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, a time and a place. And, you know, the book of Acts, again, speaking to what we would consider to be uh, uh, humans, Acts 17.26 says that God made from one man every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined that it's time set for them in the exact places where they should live. Again, I find this verse extremely encouraging. What this means is that, that you being here today is a miracle and it's a part of God's divine eternal design and that you know it just isn't a coincidence that you are born in this era in this millennia in this decade in and, and that you actually well you weren't born in this decade we have some of them in the church that have been but you were you were actually designed by God for these particular moments in life so much so that he says even the exact place where you live is ordained by God and we're thinking, wait a second, Bob, I, I made that decision. Well, yeah, you had a part in it. But if you're a Christian, and I would say even if you're not, God has a way of positioning people and orchestrating their lives so that they're at the right place at the right time doing and saying the right thing. And now we've got an evidence that this great fish that God provided was also in the right place at the right time. He had to be right there when Jonah went overboard. Because in this raging storm, it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have lasted long. Now, the water's calm, but even then, how long can you tread water? So, this fish was prepared by God. I mean, even to the point of being willing to swallow this man, whether, whether it was pure hunger or whether it was simply obedience to the command of God, we don't know. But this fish was, was right there with this particular boat over the face of the earth. Three-quarters of the earth is, is underwater and his ocean or, or seas. And, and this fish is right there with this particular boat. What are the chances of that happening? Well, if you're going by chance probability factor, it's astronomical. But if you're going by God, it's, it's everyday occurrence. So we find that this fish was in the right place. He had to also swallow this fish. I say he, we don't know. But this fish had to swallow Jonah within a very uh, brief period of time before Jonah drowned. And, uh, and so this fish actually had to be right in this particular position and simultaneously had to avoid chewing on Jonah because that would have been the end of Jonah. So this fish, there's so many dynamics. I mean, you can go on and on and on with this about the miraculous event that this fish represents. And I want to say as well that this fish, destined from the day of its birth to fulfill this singular critical role in God's life, and it's in his eternal destiny, not just for Jonah's life, but for the Ninevites. This fish has a part in it. And I, and I can't help but think how intricate God's timing is. And I think a lot of times we lose sight of how detailed and specific God is with our lives, and especially for those that call on his name. So the two reasonable, reasonable conclusions we can come to is that God is absolutely sovereign over your life. So the questions about should you be married to this person? Should you be living here? Should you be doing that or this or the other thing as long as it's not outside the will of God? I, I, I tell you, I just put those things to rest because God is more than able to get me at the right place at the right time, my heart prepared to do and say those things that honor him and participate in the work. So my job certainly is to discern the will of the Lord, your job as well, to pray about everything 
But at the end of the day, to be able to be at rest and know, man, God has more than enough ability to get you where you need to be to carry out his work. And so he strategically placed every one of us in this time and place for his eternal purposes. Jonah's problem wasn't being at the right place at the right time. Jonah's problem was his heart. That was where the problem was. Because at the end of the story, even though he was at the wrong place at the wrong time because of his disobedience, God was able to get him back to the right place at the right time doing and saying the right things. And, and that comes from a prophet who is totally in rebellion against God at that moment. And so if you have a heart for Christ, if you want to do the will of God, if your desire is to please him, I can give you confidence and, and a guarantee from scripture that you have nothing to worry about. Just be the right man, the right woman, you know, have the right heart, set yourselves aside for God, be a follower of Jesus Christ, and all the rest of it is just this divine, miraculous, epic adventure of seeing what God has next for us and then being the right people in the midst of that representing Jesus Christ. So this fish obeyed God's call. This is a great contrast, by the way, to Jonah, uh, who disobeyed God's call. I find it really ironic that, uh, and tragic, with the exception of angels and mankind, all of creation seems to obey God. It's those of us that have been given free will that have the problem. And uh, so we can use that free will to reject God or to respond to God, to do as well or to disobey as well. And we find this great fish, uh, you know, making this decision uh, to obey the call of God. And so I, I'm thinking to myself, Okay, Jonah is very desperate. Jonah's at the end of his rope. Jonah is maybe suicidal. We can't say that for certain, but it seems that all the markings are there of a man who is in absolute despair of life, wants to be thrown overboard, doesn't even have the courage to do it himself, and forces these men to take this step to save their lives. Goes overboard, and he's thinking, this is the end. I seriously doubt he was even trying to swim. I think he just, you know, you see movies where people just want to kill themselves and they just sink down and you can see the bubbles going up and their eyes are open and they're just going down, down, down. That's what I kind of envision with Jonah. He had no motivation to live. And I just can't imagine what it would be like to suddenly see this huge, massive shape coming toward you and its massive jaws opening. I mean, this isn't anything Jonah was expecting. And then suddenly to find yourself inside this fish and the mouth closes and everything completely blacks out. And then he starts feeling the stomach lining of this fish. And then he starts feeling other things in there that the fish has eaten previously and the stench, if he's even able to smell anything, but it's just got to be absolutely gross, rotting fish in a dark place. And, uh, and he, at some point here, he recognizes that this fish isn't meant for his destruction, but for his deliverance. We're going to talk about this a few times today, but the one thing I want to say right out of the gate is that if you've gone through any suffering in life, you think it's your death. You know, when you go into it, you think that the world is collapsing, that this is just the end. But after you've gone through it, you're able to see that it wasn't the death, it was actually deliverance. And if, um, if we were to give everyone here a chance to come up and kind of share a testimony about trials you've been through... Speaking of trials, that's an exciting Bible study, the theology of suffering. It's like, yay, you know, suffering. That's going to be a great class. Um, but the theology of suffering teaches us that, uh, even anecdotally, that when you go through these things, you're a better person for it if you've trusted in Christ. You're a better man, a better woman. You're transformed by these things. And so at some point, Jonah must have realized that God was not going to let him die so easily. And Jonah finds himself in this fish for three days and three nights. Now, lest we think that Jonah is uh, an isolated in incident in the Bible, we have all kinds of prayers of people that had reached this desperate state of affairs. Uh, the psalmist in chapter 88 says this, You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have overwhelmed me with all of your waves. Selah. You know... Some of you are like that right now. Some of you are barely got yourselves to church and you're going through something very difficult that there just doesn't seem to be a reasonable, logical, hopeful end to. And what I want to share with you is that God has positioned you even today to hear this message because this message is so encouraging that it's not the end. Lots of people have been where you are before and they've lived another day and they've come out the other side 
with praise on their lips for the glory of God and what God can do with people that put their trust in him. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in a similar state of discouragement. He says, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. He, he just said, this is it. I'm finished. I'm done. I can't go on. We don't think of the apostle Paul like that, but he reached the same places that we've reached before. It's common to man. But he says, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So these, these problems that we face are not uh, of little consequence. They, they have value for us. They produce some really important things. Now, in Jonah's case, part of this was the result of just a hard heart. Did Jonah have to go through all this? No, he didn't. A major reason that Jonah went through this suffering was simply because he was disobedient. So there's a lot of things in life that we don't have to go through if we'd simply obey Christ and the word of God. But it's also interesting that in the midst of Jonah's obedience, God does something really remarkable and he makes Jonah and this situation of three days and three nights in the belly of this fish to be a prophetic foreshadowing of the work of Christ. Because when the disciples were meeting with Jesus one day in Matthew chapter uh, 12, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came to him and said, you know, show us some miraculous uh, event uh, or sign so that we can know that you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, the only sign that you're going to be given is the same sign that was given to Jonah. Three days and three nights in the, in the belly of a fish, so the Son of Man will also be in the grave for three days and three nights. And so Jonah becomes a foreshadowing. Here's this guy in total disobedience, rejecting the purposes of God, saying, I'm finished, I'm done, I can't take any more. And I don't want to be a part of God's plan if it means doing this particular thing. I can't bring myself to do it. And yet, even before time began, God had a plan for this rebellious man and his, his failure to prophesy and to have compassion on a group of 120,000 people. God already in advance knew that Jonah would become a foreshadowing because that Jonah's heart would turn. I'm just wondering if there's, if there's anyone here that has gotten to a point in life where you feel like you've just kind of gone beyond God's redemptive work, that you've gone beyond the possibility of restoration. All I can tell you is, at least from Scripture, we've got lots and lots of evidence that people that thought they were way beyond the, the hand of God, way beyond the restoring of God, way beyond the redeeming power of God, have come back and been magnificent parts of God's work even sometimes when it was uh, involving some sort of a straying away from the Lord's will. So we find that uh, um, this great fish was not only appointed to deliver Jonah, but also would have a place in which uh, Psalms would be composed and, and Jonah's name would be mentioned by Jesus twice in the New Testament and that we could gain comfort from this man's failure because we've all failed and to know that God never gives up on anyone and it's never too late to respond to the voice of God. So we find in, in verse 1 this response to, to God's favor. And Jonah prays. I mean, this is like, this is an amazing text. I mean, just the fact that he prayed, this was after three days and three nights. I mean, I would have been like, I'm so sorry, get me out of this. I would have been like in there for like three seconds. And I, I would have, you, logically you'd be thinking that. But it seems to indicate that it took three days and three nights for Jonah to finally come to a point where he realized he had to face his disobedience and that he wasn't going to get away from God. We have a, there's a scripture in the book of Exodus where uh, Moses is meeting with Pharaoh and the frogs have come to the land of Egypt to be a plague, to turn Pharaoh's heart, to release the people to go worship God in the wilderness. And, uh, and it got to that point where Pharaoh and his people were just completely blown away. They were completely overwhelmed with these frogs. And they humbled out, came to, came to Moses and said, Moses, get rid of these things. We'll let you go. We'll do whatever you want to do, but get rid of these frogs. And so interestingly, the only case in, the, in all of the plagues, Moses says to him, when would you like me to do that? And Pharaoh says, how about Tomorrow. Why tomorrow? Why not do it right now? Isn't that silly? Except until we look at our own lives and it's like, okay, that's not so silly. Yeah, we kind of can relate to that. It's like, I want to do it. I know I need to do it, but can you give me some time? Well, this is where, where Jonah is. And frankly, under the circumstances, I think this man has got incredible persevering powers. 
And uh, of course, if that's harnessed for God, it can be useful. But in this particular case, that very thing that made him so tenacious and such a powerhouse for the kingdom of God was the thing that also made him have the capacity to be very disobedient to God. So I'm thinking about what it took for Jonah to turn. Well, first of all, we've, we've got the storm that, that hit. It took that. And then we've got him being rebuked by all, of all people. Pagan unbelievers are rebuking him and calling him to repent. And then he's facing de- death from this raging storm, gets thrown into the drink, and then he's swallowed by a giant fish, and then he's hanging out in the fish for three days and three nights, and then he finally has a conversation with God. I was thinking about this, and I was I, just kind of a, a, a question. No answer is necessary except in your own heart. What does it take for you to respond to God? How much pressure has to come to bear in order for you to deal with whatever it is that's in your life that might not be God's will? Whether it's some sort of an immoral relationship or some uh, problem with ethics in your business practices or we've got taxes coming around the corner. Uh, You know, your relationship with your wife, uh, unforgiven sin, uh, sin that's not repented of with people, much less with God. Maybe some things in your, in your pattern, your, your behavior, conduct, maybe an addiction of some sort where you just kind of, you keep putting God off and you keep making excuses and you keep getting more and more comfortable with whatever it is that's actually separating you from God. And in essence, you're in the belly of, of Satan's grasp. And God wants you free because he's got incredible plans for you, but you've just gotten to the point where you kind of set up house inside the big fish and try to make yourself as comfortable as you could under the circumstances. It ain't so bad anymore. It's like at first, yeah, it was dark and stinky and smelly. And, you know, my fish is rotting. I mean, my flesh is rotting on my bones. But, but you know, after a couple of weeks, that's not so bad. You know, you kind of get used to it. Well, God's will is that we would get on our knees and that we would cry out. And it wouldn't take this much. But if it has taken this much in some area of your life, I want to encourage you, the sooner the better that you have this conversation with God that Jonah had. He acknowledged in verse 2 his desperation. His, uh, he talks about God's attentiveness. Look at, let's just take a look at this. In my distress, I called out to the Lord. And then he says, and he answered me. Just admitting, I'm, 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 he's so humbled, he's so broken, he can't run, he can't hide. And now he is coming to the awareness that this is not going to end and that he's going to have to deal with it because God is not going to let go. And so he acknowledges God's attentiveness. And he also acknowledges God's discipline. He says, you hurled me. He's talking to God. God, you hurled me into the deep. I thought it was these pagan sailors. Well, it was, but the sovereign Lord was over all of that. And he recognizes it wasn't these men that threw him in, but God himself to bring him to a place of repentance into the heart of the sea. And he says, the, the current swirled around me and your waves, your waves, God, your breakers, they swept over me. There's a, there's a great passage in the book of Hebrews. In fact, keep your finger in, in Jonah here and flip over to Hebrews just for a moment, chapter 12. I want to read a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture, and it's easier if you're following along with me. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer is addressing the church, and of course the church, just like all of us in our own church, in our own lives, in our own experience in walking with God, they suffer and they go through trials and difficulties of various kinds. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 5 says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our own good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but rather painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So he's positioning, the writer, a concept that is universal 
that discipline is actually necessary, needed, and actually quite helpful in child rearing. And he makes a parallel statement about our spiritual lives. In the same way, he says, discipline by the Father, our Heavenly Father, is essential for our development and growth as his sons and daughters. In fact, he goes to say, in fact, if you aren't disciplined by him, you're illegitimate. And if we think that we don't need discipline, then we have to turn to 1 John chapter 3 and said that we're deceiving ourselves thinking that we have no sin. That's like a child saying, I, Mom and Dad, you can't discipline me because I'm perfect. Well, we have evidence that you're not perfect. Well, you might think that, but I am perfect. I mean, they can tell you forever in a day that they're, they don't deserve to be disciplined, but you know better, and your heart is to help them develop so that they can be reasonable, responsible, wonderful people as adults. And so God has the same heart for us. He wants us to share in his holiness. That's the whole purpose of discipline. And so we find that, uh, that Jonah recognizes that he's being disciplined. He knows he's wrong. He's no, he knows he's resisting the Father. He knows he's running from God, which you can't do. And so he has to come to the point of acknowledging not only has God allowed these things to happen. Now, Jonah created a lot of the problem, but God brought discipline to bear. It wasn't too much and it wasn't too little. It was just right. And I would suggest to you that how God disciplines you in your life, it's not too much and it's not too little. It's just right. It's going to seem like it's too much, but if it weren't enough to make you feel that way, it wouldn't be enough to bring about the change. And so God knows just the right amount of discipline to bring into our life so that we can be delivered from ourselves and our rebellion and then to be walking in this righteousness and in this holiness of God so that we can experience this plan. So God has got this eternal and wonderful, glorious plan for our ultimate good and his ultimate purposes. And it's so important to God that he's actually willing to let us experience short-term suffering so that we can experience eternal glory in being a part of his work. So I find this story of Jonah enormously encouraging that we've got a guy that's just about as bad as you can get in trying to rebel against God and God was able to bring him back. And in the New Testament, we have another guy that was just about as bad as you can get, Paul, who says, I'm on display for the whole world to, to demonstrate that God can do anything with anyone, even those that feel that they're beyond the reach of God's redemptive work. So the, 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 uh, the thing that I'm kind of coming away from this particular section of Scripture and Jonah's plight that he's in right now is if you're wise, correction will only take a light rebuke. If you're wise, it'll only take a, a light rebuke. But if you're foolish, it may take wild storms and even near-death experiences to bring you around. And God leaves that choice to us. We have that choice. So a very basic principle, obedience leads to blessing. Disobedience leads to discipline. God just won't give up on you. So you're going to experience either the blessing or the disobedience and the suffering that goes along with it. And really, in many respects, it's up to you. So in verse 4 through 6, he says that he recognizes his own helplessness. He says, I know I've been banished from your sight. I know that, uh, <clears throat> that I'm being threatened by these engulfing waters. He has seaweed wrapped around his head. He's like the very first Mediterranean musubi uh, known to mankind. He sank helplessly to the bottom of the sea. He anticipated that this would be a watery imprisonment and death. And he, and he says, my life was ebbing away. So he realizes that though he's in this desperate condition, that there's still hope. And he cries out in verse 7 for deliverance. And there he says, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. In this place of desperation, he said, I remembered you. It's not that he'd forgotten God. You know, God says the same thing, by the way, in different passages, that God remembered his people. God never forgets his people. But he gives attention to them again in a particular way. And in this fashion, Jonah also hadn't forgotten about God. It was on his mind 24-7 because of his situation in particular. But in remembering, he gave attention to this relationship with God once again. And by virtue of that, he called on the Lord and he did what Jeremiah 33 says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and marvelous, unsearchable things that you don't know. And he makes a confession of faith in verse 8. He, he announces, interestingly, the futility of following and worshiping false gods. 
Why is he referencing this? Well, do you remember the pagan gods that the, the sailors were calling out to just, you know, a few days before? They were calling out to these pagan gods. And, and when they saw the work of God through Jonah, from God through Jonah's life, they all repented. And they, and they made commitments and they made sacrifices and they made vows to God. Something dynamic and, and supernatural happened. I believe these men came to a saving knowledge of God through a disobedient prophet. And now Jonah recalls that. And he says, ah, you know, it's futile to, to pursue these false gods. And, you know, there's no one that can hear. There's no God that actually can save except the one true God. Buddha can't hear and deliver Vishnu doesn't answer prayers. Krishna can't meet your needs. Even the Pope has no power to deliver from life or death the soul of any man or woman. And of course, you know, money, power, uh, our self, our, our, uh, whatever we might aim at in life doesn't have the power to deliver you from death. Only God has that power to do that. And so Jonah makes this confession and he says that people that actually Worship and cling to these worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Very interesting little phrase. The forfeiture of God's grace. What's God's grace? It's, it's his blessing and his favor in spite of demerit. So it's when God gives you something you don't deserve. And so when we actually worship something else or rely on something else, most of you aren't worshiping uh, idols in your house. Some of you might be, but most of you aren't. And uh, you don't have little statues and you don't have little carvings that you actually look to for guidance or help or relief. But in our culture, in our time, the thing that really is that for us is our, is our economics, our, our finances. And we pour over those things and we look at our, our life insurance and our health insurance and our car insurance and we try to insulate, 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 insulate ourselves so that nothing bad can happen to us and it happens anyway. You know, a lot of you are going through that. And... and for us, it's so important that we not cling to these things because they are worthless idols. They can't save and deliver. And so the sooner that, that whatever your situation, financial situation, some of you are just barely making it. And month to month is the best you can do. Others of you have, you know, significant sums of money stocked away in property or real estate or, you know, businesses or whatever. But wherever you are on that spectrum, the one thing I can tell you is that none of that can ever save you. It will never deliver you. Only God can help you. Only God can help you through these situations. We have evidence of that all across the, the newspaper, across the globe. Rich people in desperate straits, killing themselves, killing each other, being in despair, being on drugs, being alcoholics, uh, being on, on pain medication. For, just, their life just unraveling. Money and position and power cannot deliver. But God can. And Jonah finally acknowledges that. But if we don't accept that, if we don't come to Christ first, in essence, we're forfeiting the grace, this free gift, this free partnership, this, this involvement of God Almighty in our problems in resolving them and moving us forward could be there, but we forfeit it. You actually forfeit it when you rely on your own resources to get yourself out of your fix. When we don't pray, when we don't cry out to him, when we don't bother fasting or really seeking the Lord on things, all we're saying to God is that we don't really need his help. And when we really need him, we'll call on him. And so thank you very much. And so God, in essence, says, okay, you're going to forfeit that for right now. Are you all right with that? Oh, yeah, sure. I got it. No problem. I can handle this one. The big one's for you, God. This one's for me. And then, of course, you know, and we find ourselves in the belly of the fish. So the rule of thumb is sooner is better. Respond and yield. Well, we find a, a transition taking place in verse 9. He personally responds to God. Um, look what it says. He says, with a song of thanksgiving. Wow, that's faith. He's giving God thanks. Suddenly he, he turns because he turns to God. He sees things and this problem from a different perspective and it promotes worship in his heart. He knows that God's doing something. He recognizes the game isn't up. Do you know another person? We find this in the New Testament too. Remember when Peter and, and the disciples were imprisoned? What did they do? They worshiped God. Paul did the same thing, worship God. Big things happen when we worship God in the middle of our problems. That's why it says in Philippians chapter 4 that you know, we're not to be anxious about any, anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is an act of faith. It's an act of confidence and it's an act of worship to God before the problem's resolved. And you're telling God, I trust you completely. God, you've got this totally under control. Everything has been positioned before time began for me to go through this in a way that brings you honor. And God, my primary desire isn't my 
safety or my comfort or my pleasure, my primary desire is your purposes to prevail and for your glory to be magnified. And God, if you can use me in that situation, have at it. But I'm totally yours, totally available, totally surrendered. And when you do that and you act and worship, God just goes to town. And this is the first thing that Jonah did. And then he, he makes sacrifice. We don't know exactly how he was able to do that, but I think it was probably of his heart just surrendering and saying, like Paul said in Romans 12:1, you know, that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what God wanted. He didn't need a sacrifice in that fish. He needed the heart of a man to be absolutely surrendered and yielded with no preconditions at all. And he made vows as well. And um, I think the, the vows must have been fairly obvious. His vow was to obey God and go to Nineveh. There's a really good principle, by the way, uh, when you're not sure what God's will is for your life. People come to me, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Well, what, when was the last time you really felt like you knew what God's will was? They back up, they tell me the story. The rule of thumb is keep doing what he told you to do last until he gives you new instructions. And so if he told you to do something, and you made a decision that it wasn't working, and you backed out of that or moved away from it or gave up on it, and then you're waiting for new instructions, it's quite possible that God will say, well, I told you what to do, and you made the decision to go AWOL. So go back and do what I told you to do. And so I don't want to give any, you know, just generalized statements about that because everybody's circumstances are different. But what I will say is that God does reveal his will, and oftentimes we don't like it because it's too costly, it's too painful, it, it, it requires too much. And so if you're not sure what God's will is, then go and ask him. James says that we can ask. God will give us wisdom. You know, he wants to give it to us. So ask him. Find out what it is and then go back and do those things that he told you to do. And more than likely, you'll be in the will of God. And then God, if he chooses to, can redirect uh, that new work in your life. And so he acknowledges that he needed deliverance. And so he prayed and made these vows. And uh, something really changed in his life. And he ex acknowledged that, that the Lord was the source of salvation. Well, because of that, it was like suddenly the lesson was learned. And class was out of session. The bell rang. And the fish vomited Jonah up on the beach. <laughs> I'm talking about an unceremonial way to come. I mean, he's an ambassador of, of God. He's coming to give a very important message on behalf of Israel. And he's representing Israel to, this, to these uh, enemies that he hates. I mean, wh you know, any time that you're representing someone of that, you know, kind of a significant role, you want to be dressed up, you want to look your best, you want your teeth brushed, your, your hair combed, you want to have gone over the speech a few times, you want to make sure that you've got all the protocol in place. And uh, this picture isn't what you're envisioning. Uh, you know, I probably am not the only one, uh, but because I've been a pastor most of my life, I have dreams occasionally of, um, of not being prepared on Sunday morning. I have dreams of showing up in my underwear and, uh, and, and, and suddenly realizing that I don't have my clothes on. I'm sorry to be so honest with you, but that's, you know, you probably have dreams like that. Or I, I, I can't find my sermon, and I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know, I have no idea what I'm supposed to preach on. I just hear my name. Or I'm at a conference somewhere, and then suddenly somebody says, and, and Bob Holman's going to come and give the message, and I didn't even know I was supposed to speak. And, and I'm just like, uh, you know, reeling. And that's a, that's a lack of preparation. But it's a, it's a kind of a nightmare. And so Jonah finds himself... If, if, of all things, spit up on the beach, his, his flesh is all bleached, he stinks, he's got seaweed wrapped around his head, he, he's putrid, I, I'm no doubt there's some people on the beach and watch this event unfold and just thought, this is incredible. And then this guy starts preaching the gospel of repentance, which is what Jesus preached and what John the Baptist preached. We've got to repent. And he, and he confronts their sin. It's got to be the most incredible story I mean, one of the most, because the Bible's just filled with them. But he gets spit up on the beach, and he, and he walks in obedience. If I were him, I would have, you know, run somewhere to go get a change of clothes or something. But we don't have any evidence that he did that. Now, he probably did, because he was there for a number of days preaching. But he just went to town. He was like, I'm, I'm done with disobeying. I'm done with preconditions. I'm done with having to look a certain way and be perceived a certain way and be accepted. I'm done with the pleasure of people. I care about the pleasure of God. I want to win the heart of God. I want to do what God wants. I don't care what people think anymore. Have you ever gotten to that point? That's a really important point to get to in your Christian life where suddenly it doesn't matter anymore what people say. 
and you speak what God puts on your heart, even with the fact that you're not perfect, even with the fact that you've got bleached skin and you've got some seaweed wrapped around your head and you've got some stuff stuck in your teeth and your breath isn't so good. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm just talking about the condition of your spiritual life. If we had to be perfect, if we had to be, you know, have everything right to preach the gospel, we'll never preach the gospel. So we have to preach it like we are and know that it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It's not you. It's God. It's the gospel itself that has power. It helps a lot if you're, if you, if you're a clear voice. It helps a lot if, you're, if your life is matching up with that word. But preach the gospel. That's the message that we have here. So God commanded this fish to spit Jonah out. Immediately the fish obeyed and vomited Jonah onto dry ground. And again, I think about the importance of obedience of this fish. What if this fish had said, mm, I don't really want to, and waited three more days? Would Jonah have lived? No, probably not. What if the fish had deli delayed um, and said, you know, I don't really like beaching myself. That goes completely contrary to my nature, so I'm going to vomit him out, you know, 15 miles out in the Mediterranean. Or what if he decided that, uh, he again, I don't know, but what if this fish decided, I'm going to vomit him, I'm going to be in, in obedience to God, but I'm going to do it, you know, a mile under the surface of the water. I mean, any of these things, I mean, the, the, the intricacy of God's plan and his power is, is unfathomable for us. And I want to share with you that, that that same power, that same sovereignty is at work in the complexity of your life. You only see the surface. We don't know anything. God is working. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. He's got redemptive things that he's got going on for you. He's got things going on that you know nothing about. Plans from before time began and events that you're to partner in, things that he's using you to, to accomplish if you're willing. And some of you are in this place of, you know, uh, you're being disciplined. And God has been speaking to you. He's just not going to give up. And so the, the wisdom would say, well, let me just respond so I can get out of this cycle and get on to what's next and be a part of the plan of God. So I, I find it... Um, fascinating, not only to think about what the scripture says, but what it doesn't say and all the ramifications of timing and events and place and animals and God's command and God's sovereignty and all these things. And in the midst of all that, somehow God is able to help us be a part of our own free will to make decisions. And somehow at the end of the day, having made decision as Christians, following him and obeying him, that somehow in the, in the uh, lack of information we've got and the lack of, of understanding of all these complex events that are intersecting throughout human history in order for us to be here at this moment and for our lives to make a difference in the complexity of all that, somehow it seems so simple to us. And we have to just make this decision or that decision. We have to get up at this time and we go do that. We've got this little list. We've got our daily to-do list. And that's about as far as we get. We've got some plans for the future. But by and large, it, it's, just, it's dwarfed by this enormity of God's plan for your life. And that's why God says, I've got plans for you, not to harm you, but to give you a future and a hope. God's always working in your behalf. And the only thing he's looking for is somebody that's just willing to say, I quit on my plan. I quit on rebelling. I quit on being in sin and being in disobedience and being carnal and being compromised and kind of living on the edge and, you know, kind of coming to church and being halfway in and halfway out. I'm not saying any of you are that way. You're one of the most loving and committed and fruitful churches I've ever been a part of. And I'm not trying to compare you to other churches, but you guys are excelling. And, and my heart is like, I just, I read this and I think, I want to excel more. I, I want to be more in the middle of God's will. I want to give more. I want to surrender more. I don't want to be Jonah. But I've been him before. And there are times that I want to run. There are times I want to go AWOL. And by God's grace, I don't know how. He keeps me standing and he keeps you standing. So stay with your marriage. Stay with your kids. Stay with your job unless God is actually calling you. Stay with, with the work that God has called you to do. With that, that vision that he's given you. Don't give up on it. Because he's planted it there for a purpose so that you could be a part of this great work. What's his great work? Salvation. That's his great work. If you back up and you look forward to the, everything that God is doing in the book of Jonah, what does he care about? He cares about people being redeemed. He cares about your friends and your family. He cares about your coworkers. He cares about people that you know in the community that you enjoy spending time with and even those that you don't. God has this enormous love 
The purpose of Jesus was to come and to seek and save that which was lost. Not just the people of Israel, but the magnificent plan that also included the Gentile, which makes up most of us. I'm encouraging you. Don't miss out on it. If you're in despair today because of problems, yield yourself to God. Cry out to him. Give him thanks. Worship him. Praise him. Even if you don't know how it's going to turn out, just acknowledge that he is in control. You don't know just but a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the amount of God's eternal purposes that he's bringing to bear in this situation to shape you, yes, to mold you, yes, to transform you, absolutely, but also to accomplish his will. You're a part of it if you're willing. Well, the good news is that though Jonah resisted, that God's redemptive love and grace was sufficient to restore and bring this prophet back to a state of usefulness, which is where we're going to pick it up next week. But I, I want to encourage you that um, if you are a person that's been kind of jumping from ship to ship and from storm to storm, and we know people like that, and some of us are people or have been people like that, where it's just like one crisis after another. If you want to, if you want to see it, read Facebook. And uh, uh, because, you know, if you got, you got your Facebook friends, and there are always those Facebook friends that just crisis, 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 crisis. Oh, happy day, crisis, 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 crisis. And we're all saying to them, don't keep doing these same things. It's like, what well, I just love doing those things. It's like, and they're Christians. It's like, you can see what happens. Don't live that way. It's, it's a waste of time. It, it, it steals, it robs you of the eternal purposes of God and waylays you from what God could do and wants to do through your life so that you can participate in the divine nature. Let go of that life and embrace God. So if you're in the belly of a fish today, some sort of a problem, some sort of a conundrum, some sort of a difficulty, some sort of a brokenness, I want to encourage you to, to cry out to God. Give him thanks for his plan. Recognize the smallness of your understanding and then make yourself available. Worship him. Yield to him. Make vows to him not of what you're going to do, but just surrender your life and saying, I'm giving you my life. That's what he wants. He doesn't want your stuff. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your partnership. He wants you to be a follower of his son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for this text this morning and the, uh, the great honor it is to learn from our friend Jonah. I thank you that the Bible is not a whitewashed version of history, but it lays out the uh, uncharacteristically in most histories of most nations and most people, they, they write the good stuff. And here we've got Jonah recounting his terrible failure and his utter disobedience and how you were able to use him as an illustration of what you can do with a man or woman that's willing to respond to the trials of life, some of which come directly from your hands, some of which come from the enemy, some are just a part of life. We don't know. But God, we know when we're wrong with you. We know when we're not right and your spirit convicts us. I pray for every man and woman here today that if there's something that, that you're touching in our life and speaking to us about, that we would make a decision today to get that made right and that we would find ourselves back on track. And God, if, if you spit us up on the beach today from our problem and deliver us, we'd be totally happy about that. <laughs> that would be awesome. But Lord, if it's going to take a little longer, we're happy with that too. We want to be in your will. We want to be found useful in your kingdom. And we want to be found near to the heart of our God. So bless every man and woman here. Give them a, a fruitful week. And we thank you, God, for the privilege of studying your word and belonging to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.